I had this on my mind last night, and it wouldn't leave me alone. All to, even when I was taking a little snooze this afternoon, I, it just seemed like the Lord just kept leaning in that direction. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, take your Bible, turn to uh, Galatians 1, Deuteronomy 32, John 15, 2 Corinthians 2. Where else? Mark 14, now. Let's go to Galatians first. Let's have a word of prayer. Yeah. One of these days, all this artificial intelligence they got, they ought to have it read the Bible. Okay? Uh, I, I almost, here's, I got a little theory for you. I think they either have uh, or are going to and this artificial intelligence super genius is going to tell everybody it's not true. And everybody's going to go, oh, wow, the, the super intelligent computer told us it's not true. Yeah. So I'm learning, I'm learning that there is so much of modern, current scientific thought that is not original with scientific discovery. It's actually, a lot of it is being based upon old, wrong, religious ideas. The Big Bang is not original in physics. It comes from several accounts of the creation of the universe where, uh, like the Jewish Kabbalah, and there's other, I can't, I can't name the religious things, but in Jewish Kabbalah, they have this uh, thing called Adam Kadmon, and he is the primordial man. And before him, there was nothing. And Adam Kadmon exploded because his greatness was so awesome that he just couldn't contain it. So he exploded everywhere, and out of him came the formation of all the stars, planets, comets, meteors, and living creatures, okay? So that everything that exists is all a piece of the God, Adam Kadmon, okay? And all that lives has a divine spark, has a piece of that divine spark in them, okay? And um, that's where the Big Bang come from. Big Bang says that all of the universe was contained if you want to know it in song form, the whole universe was in a dark, dense state. But anyway, that's a TV show. But anyway, um, that it was in a great, it was a very, very small ball of all the matter that's in the universe in one little point. And that exploded. And in a fraction of a second, it exploded out into the billions and billions of light years and then after about a billion light year, a billion years, then all these galaxies started forming from that, and then thus our galaxy, the Milky Way, and then Earth, and then us. So whether it's the Big Bang in physics or the Big Bang in Gnostic thought, it is the same exact idea. So you have science and everybody else's religion all in agreement with the exception of us. Okay? Bible believers and the Bible itself. Because it does not teach that. Amen? Don't try to put a big bang into the Bible. You don't see it. It's not there. Those evening in the morning were the first day. That's not these epics of time. You know, billions of years. Every day was a billion years or so that God used to form everything. That's not what it says. Evening and the morning were the first day. How long is that? How long is the evening and the morning? 24 hours from this morning to the next morning. So anyway, we have a lot of people that, uh, against us as far as people here. But we have an innumerable company of angels on our side. Amen? Uh, Galatians 1, and we'll go from there. It's good to have you with us tonight. Good to be here and good to have everybody online. We appreciate you and love you and... And uh, I always just hope to be a blessing to everybody. I really do. Just want to be uh, part of the team that wins. I don't, Caleb will tell you, I don't like losing. 
if I pick a team in sports, I don't like it when my team loses, okay? I, nobody in this church has ever played chess with me, have you? Anybody? There's a reason why. Because what's in me when I play chess comes out. Meaning, I will throw the pieces all across the room. If you take my queen in the first three moves, we're done, okay? I don't, I don't, that's just me. So anyway, I like to be on the winning team, amen? Yeah, <laughs> let's go have a turkey shoot, shall we? <laughs> oh, Father in heaven, it's good to be together with brothers and sisters. It's good to be together with you. It's good to be in agreement, Lord, on the word of God. And God, whatever this book says, it's what the book says. We thank you for it. Thank you, God, that it settles all the arguments and keeps our mouth shut and, and helps us along in life and corrects us and gives us hope and gives us eternal life and it is the gospel. And Father, we just pray for so many people, Lord, who have abandoned this, who've walked away from it, especially, Lord, in light of what I believe, Lord, you've laid on my heart tonight. And uh, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that, uh, that you would use uh, whatever this church does uh, to, to let it ring true in people's hearts, Lord, as they, as they hear it. Maybe they hear it for the first time. But, Lord, they hear it, and they know it. They know it deep down inside. They know it's right. And it's your Holy Ghost telling them that. So, Father, we just ask God to let us in this church be a blessing, be a blessing one to another, be a blessing to all those that, that are watching right now online, be a blessing to all of those who will watch this for many days to come. We pray, God, that you would use it for your glory's sake, your name's sake, your kingdom's sake. Let you, the Lord Jesus, receive all the praise and all the glory for it and all the thanks for it. Thank you for your word tonight. Bless us, Lord. Help us as we uh, go through our lives, go through this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Galatians chapter 1 is what I'm teaching on in Sunday school. It's very important to me. Uh, but though we are an angel from heaven preaching the other gospel unto you, then that which you have preached, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so say now I again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Very seldom in the Bible does the Bible immediately repeat itself. It does at, on occasions, but it's not often. So here Paul, same breath, same paragraph, same, he's making the same statement over again. He is pushing this thing and pushing this issue of the correct gospel. And he's, make, he's, not, he's, me, he's not being nice about it. Paul, it, when he had to be mean, was mean. And he wasn't going to be nice about it. And when people needed to be thrown out, Paul said, let's throw them out. If people needed to be forgiven, Paul said, let's forgive them. But when it comes to the gospel and it comes to the source of that gospel, I'm not... I mean, I want to be encouraging. There are pastors out there, I believe, that are now the way I used to be in that they, have, they received this teaching on the Bible from the Bible colleges, from the seminary, and that's just what they got stuck in their mind, and they, don't, they didn't question it. That's, and in order to be accepted by everybody, they had to go along with this, and that's the way I used to be. I think that, hopefully, there's still some good men out there that with the leading of God, the way God led in me, and maybe just some encouragement from some ministers or from some people to study this thing out, to get it settled, where are we going to find the real gospel at? Get this thing settled in our minds and our hearts. Maybe there's some people out there that still can be won over to the truth of the Word of God, not Mike Hoggard's truth, not Bethel Church truth, but the truth of the Word of God, this Bible is right in everything it says. It cannot be wrong. It cannot be mistaken. It cannot be corrupt. It cannot be fallen into disarray. God did not just inspire the originals and then take his hand off and, and walk away from it. Um, by the way, Ryan told me some things before church, and if he's right, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the source of this modern textual criticism movement. Okay? You'll never guess in a hundred minutes where it came from. Okay, they, they, they criticize the Greek text saying that the text of the King James is not the true original Greek text that's full of errors and mistakes. We shouldn't follow it. Let's follow these other manuscripts. I'm going to deal a little bit about that tonight. 
But the source of that idea, the source of that doctrine, it's very interesting. So, Ryan, you're on. So I, I named you in front of everybody. You got to put up or shut up. Amen? All right. So anyway, but Paul's making it very clear. He says, and notice, he knows Paul didn't say, now, if somebody else preaches another gospel, then what, then let them be accursed. Paul said, though we, though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, let them be accursed. It's, Paul's not, um, he's not, what's, what's, what am I trying to say? He's not raising himself up above everybody saying, I can never be wrong. What he's saying is, if you ever hear me, any of the other apostles, or anybody pretending to be those apostles, say anything other than what is in here, then let them be accursed. And notice he specifically mentioned an angel from heaven. Now fortunately for us, we have a religion that perfectly fits that category. It's called Mormonism. The Mormon church specifically says that an angel came from heaven, revealed to Joe Smith the location of golden plates, that these golden plates written in what was some form of Egyptian hieroglyphic that nobody had ever seen before, and that only Joe Smith could translate them. Nobody else knew the language. Nobody else knew, the, knew the, the writing or the letters. No one knew the words. Joe Smith put on these special Urim and Thummim glasses. Like those x-ray specs you could get out of comic books for a dollar when we was kids. Okay? He put on the special glasses. And according to him, he looked at the Egyptian golden hieroglyphic plates... And he would instantly translate it and write it down. Nobody, nobody actually saw the golden plates that Joseph Smith said that he translated from. No one saw this angel. No one saw Joseph Smith translating this. No one did. He is a single witness to his whole story. And yet millions of people all over the world follow him. That ought to tell you the stupidity of man. And you and I were of such like until God shone light down in us. Amen? So we're not better than anybody else. But here we have an angel specifically coming down bringing another gospel. And lo and behold, it's a gospel of works obedience. If you don't do this, you cannot go to heaven. If you do not marry a Mormon wife you cannot and have Mormon children, then you cannot have... A place in the celestial kingdom. You cannot have your own planet that you're going to be a god over. You cannot, you cannot have those things. And it's strict obedience to Mormon rules that brings you salvation. It could be said that the Catholic Church, likewise, has a very similar idea. In that, saints, certain of their so-called saints, have received direct revelations, or people have received revelations from some of these saints, like Saint Mary... There, there are people who say that Mary visited them and gave them extra biblical revelations and things to do. And more often than not, whenever the Virgin Mary appears to people and gives them instructions, almost always it, she tells them, uh, pray the rosary, pray the Hail Marys, take the Mass, and do what the priests tell you to do. Almost without fail, these apparitions of Mary are telling them to perform everything the Catholic Church tells them to perform in order to have a chance, now, a chance to be saved. So it's the same idea. So here comes the Virgin Mary. Now, and now think about what Paul said. Because the Catholic Church says that Mary and Peter and Paul, you know, it's a group from the 60s. If Peter, Paul, and Mary show up, and they have, and they come down from heaven, and they give all these other instructions, they give these instructions to everybody saying, you've got to just pray the rosary, you've got to go to mass, and you've got to, do, you've got to confess, and you've got to do all these things. That also fits into what Paul's saying. Because they're like angels from heaven. They're like we or an angel from heaven bringing you any other gospel. Paul said, don't believe them. So, you have a billion Roman Catholics who are accursed. Why? 
They believed it in contradiction to the scriptures. Scriptures, Paul said, if it looks like us, sounds like us, appears like us, but it tells you another gospel, they're cursed. This gospel's not a curse. Follow this gospel, okay? Now, my theory is that at some point in the future, angels are going to appear. And they're going to lead everybody into this last apostate gospel. The New Age is all about that. The New Age leaders, they're all anticipating that the ascended masters, these spirits who are giving people direct revelations of things, that these ascended masters are going to come and visit the earth, uh, probably under different forms, but everybody's going to, everybody's going to fall for it. The Muslims are going to fall for it. The Buddhists are going to fall for it. The New Agers are going to fall for it. The Baptists, the Pentecostals, the Nazarenes, the Roman Catholics, the, the Methodists, those who are not sealed with the Holy Ghost, they are all going to fall for it. There's going to be an angel, probably, from every religion. And, and they're, going to re, they're going to hear a new, last days, final apostasy gospel. And they're going to fall for it. And the instructions given to us by Paul are, if it doesn't sound like what I just said in this book, it's accursed. Okay? Keep that in mind. Why am I saying this? I don't know. Could, something could happen tomorrow. This thing could start going down this week. This thing could start going down while I'm on vacation. I won't have a cell phone. You can't call me. Which will bother me every day, I guarantee you. How's everything going? I'm not kidding you. I, I'm better at it now than I used to be, but years gone by, I always had this feeling that if I went away for three or four days or a week, the whole church was going to burn to the ground. It was, everybody was going to leave all at once. They were going to throw me out. Yeah. You should have knew the people back then. You wouldn't laugh, okay? So anyway, um, I'm not as bad about it as I used to be. You're too sick. Don't, yeah, don't do it. But what would happen if God decides to turn this loose in a week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever? Okay? And you're going to have to decide, is this the truth or is this a lie? And all you got to do is measure it up against these words right here. If it doesn't say these words, then don't buy it. Don't fall for it. Okay? Um, turn to Deuteronomy 32. Let's get in. Let's follow the setup in modern. When I say modern times, I'm going to say from the time of Christ onward. Okay, I'm not going to get so much into the old how this appeared in the Old Testament, uh, though it did, but how this appears now. Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. I've used this many times. But I haven't, there's part of this section of Deuteronomy 32 that I've not really talked about much, but it fits together. Deuteronomy 32, there is a, uh, a song, if you look at verse 30 of, of chapter 31, And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. So Moses actually sings, wouldn't that be cool to hear Moses singing a song? Okay. Moses, David saying, I'd love to hear David, okay? But it's really neat because the Bible says that Jesus sings. Wouldn't you love to hear that? I think I would just melt hearing the, the sweet singing of Jesus. So this is a song that, that was given to Moses by the Holy Ghost, and he's singing it, rehearsing it in the ears of the Israelites. So he says in verse 28, For they are a nation void of counsel. Void of counsel means they don't have a Bible. And they, don't, they wouldn't read it if they had it. Because the counsel is the Bible. It's the word of God. They are a nation void of counsel. 
neither is there any understanding in them. Now, specifically, that really is the decayed, corrupt nature of all mankind. You were not born with the super smarts to figure out the gospel all on your own. The Holy Ghost had to come to you and shine light in you and change your thinking, change your mind, change your heart, change everything. Who in here has come from any other religious ideology other than we believe the Bible? Who came out of something to come into the gospel? Okay, you did, you did. Y'all did, you did. John, I saw your hand. Okay. Courtney, you did. Okay. She went. I thought she was raising her hand. Yeah. Who was your Sunday school teacher here? That's what I want to know. Um, God had to shine light in you. Because you were accepting things that were not true. Why? You're void of understand. You're void of counsel, and you have no understanding in you. It wasn't until let there be light happened. Four. Okay. Wasn't until that happened that God finally woke you up. So He said, "Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their what latter end." Boy, I tell you what, that'll wake you up. The whole point of Wanting to know the gospel and all this stuff is you consider your latter end. Where am I going to end up? Where does this road lead? There's a road that leads to heaven. It's a straight on road. There is a road that leads to hell that is almost in line with the road that leads to heaven. As it starts out, but as it keeps going, it keeps getting farther and farther and farther and farther away. Okay? So we, it's very important. Get this thing right. So, uh, how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? The Lord uh, chased a thousand away from you. Chased, put ten thousand to flight. The rock did that for you. For their rock is not as our rock. You know, I'm curious how many times the word rock it's capitalized in the King James. Who can find that out? Go to web, get on your phone and go to webchannel.purebiblesearch.com. Got it? Type in the word rock, capital R. Okay? Their rock is not as... Now, the beginning of a sentence wouldn't count, I, won't, I don't think. Eight, check... To make sure they're not at the beginning of a sentence, like they're following the rules of capitalization. I don't know why, I just thought about that. Their rock is not as our rock. Uh, and um, It's still eight? That's good. Eight is what? New life, new beginnings. Okay? Yeah. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes, this is the fruit from those vines. The grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. So it's like eating persimmons before persimmon time. You ever ate a persimmon before persimmon time? Anybody? You'll never do it again. It'll take you 30, 45 minutes. To rake that out of your mouth. Okay? It is bitter, dry, it's awful. But persimmons, when they come in season, I, I can eat them all day long. Sweet as things. That's, if, if you were to deliver me a bowl of fruit, if I was real sick, bring persimmons. Okay? Good luck finding them. But anyway, uh, their vine is vine of Sodom. Grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons. Dragons, serpents, whales, all of those words are interchangeable in the Bible. Cruel venom of asps. So we're dealing with the devil and we're dealing with devils, plural. Poison of dragons. The poison of a dragon, the poison of a serpent is wares in its tails, at its claws. 
It comes from its mouth. It comes from its tongue. Okay? And so we used to think that the tongue of a lizard or a snake was poisonous. If the tongue touched you, you'd be poisoned. That's not true. The poison, though, does come from their mouth. God designed it that way to give us this understanding. That means the serpent in the Garden of Eden was poisoning Eve in a different way than normal serpents do it now. Normal serpents will just put two fangs in you, inject the poison in. The poison goes in, it'll stop your heart, it'll clot your blood up in the veins, it'll do all these terrible things. If it doesn't kill you, it will, it will hurt you real bad. But in the days where Israel murmured against God and complained in the book of uh, Numbers, God allowed these serpents to come in and they bit them, poisoned them, and these people all died. And so that is a picture, not just of Israel, but it's a picture of us. We're all poisoned by that self-same dragon. We all have this idea of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, and it kills us. It's, it, it's going to kill us. It's going to put a stop to us. So their wine is the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of ass. So, I mean, we, we have these themes here. We have a vine. We have fruit or grapes, and we have the wine or the juice extracted from that is absolute pure poison. It's bitter to the taste, but that doesn't stop some people. Okay? I, when, when, when I was young, my dad drank beer, and every now and then we'd be fishing or something like that, and I'd be real thirsty, and dad would give me a drink. And it, after one sip, I'm not thirsty anymore. You want another one? No, I don't want any more. I didn't like it. I don't know why he's tossing this down. Okay, I'm going, what are you doing? That's awful. Okay, thank God. <laughs> you did that for me. But it doesn't matter to some people. They just bring it on anyway. But it, if it's not at least bitter to the taste, it's bitter to the results. Amen? Who knows that? Okay? So, the vine... The grapes and the wine, symbolic of, here we have uh, doctrine, we have teachings, we have a spirit. All of these, the Bible is telling you that vines and grapes and wine or the extract, the juice from this grape or whatever it is, these are all pictures of doctrine. They're pictures of a spirit. And that spirit's going to cause you to see or be blind. Okay? No one ever says, well, I'm going to drink myself sighted. Right? It's the opposite. I'm going to drink myself blind. So I can't see no more. That's the idea. So, let's contrast that. Now, I've done this before, but it, I'm going to take a little bit different route. John 15, turn there. Verse 1, I am the true vine. True vine. So we have... The vine of Sodom, the poison of dragons, the lies. Sodom, the vine, the, the grapes, and the wine, all of that working together to spread lies. Then we have the opposite of that, a different vine. It is Christ, and his vine is 100% true all the time. If it lies once, then it's not true. Okay? And again, this is by God's standard. God's standard is 100% perfection to the utmost highest and no, zero falsehood, zero lie, zero corruption, nothing. With God, it's pure, holy, sanctified as He is. And if God said something is true, then it's true 100% of the time and cannot ever be in a lie. Okay? I don't know of anybody who qualifies for that. Nobody does. So Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So it begs the question then, can some church people go to hell? I'm pretty careful about what I say. Can church members 
members of a congregation, can they die and go to hell? Doing it all the time. The fact that they were not sealed, sons of God, born again, the fact that they were not has nothing to do with what God offered to do in their life. It has everything to do with what they rejected about God's offer. Okay? They rejected it. They are like the false brethren that Paul spoke of in Galatians. False brethren, unawares, brought in. They come in looking like brethren. They come in looking like Christians, acting like Christians, sounding like Christians. But God knows that they're false. Their conversion was false. Their conversion was never, ever, with God, it was never permanent. Never. And God wasn't fooled. God never said, oh great, they're saved, amen, praise me. That's a little joke. God never said that. God never was fooled when they came to an altar and prayed and made confession or whatever. God knew from before the foundation of the world that that was a, that was a temporary riddance of guilt to soothe their own soul. And that once they had this little knowledge that they, everything was going to be okay, right back out into sin again. Some of them stayed in church. Some of them never come back to church. You see what I'm saying? Okay? God was never fooled by these people. God, when they came, they asked, they became partakers they tasted, but they never, they, they were like the, the, um, the fallow ground or the stony ground where the seed went in and lo and behold it sprang up, had no root. Because it had no root, it produces no what? Fruit. John 15 is going to show you that. It produces no fruit. Same with those who fall among thorns. They will come up. But the thorns will choke out any possibility. So you have an appearance that they are born again, that they're saved or whatever, but they're not. And again, God's not fooled by that. We may be fooled by it, but God is not fooled by that. So this is why I am real careful about telling people whether or not I think they're saved or not. I mean, I, I personally have to know it, and I have to know it by fruit, okay? Because in my life, I have seen too many people in this same church come in and go back out, and they're not, they either are not coming back, or they never came back, and they died. So, what God did was, God took them off, Cast them away, just like he did with Israel in Romans 11. He took them off of that olive tree and cast them away. Then God found somebody that he knew would. He grafted them in. Boom, there they are. He said, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. That's what you go through in life. You go through the purging. That it may bring forth more Fruit. If you bring forth fruit, people, the real fruit, you're saved. You're saved. Mark 4, Matthew 13, those are the places, the, that parable of the seed and the sower. If it brings forth fruit, that is God showing you that you're right with Him, that you're saved. Okay? So, now you are clean through the word, here it is, which I have spoken unto you. My, again, I look at this and I say, how can I be clean from a dirty word? How can I be clean from a word that is defiled? How can I be clean from a word that is corrupt? Okay, because I was the younger of two siblings, 
I got the dirty bath water. Back in a time when mom and dad didn't have a lot of money, and they poured a bath, and Melissa got in first and took hers, and then me. I got the secondhand, you know, those old westerns, right? Where they, you know, bath, 25 cents. Clean water, 50 cents, <laughs> okay? That's how it was. So how can you be clean? How can you be clean from a word that is not clean? Can't. So, uh, now you're clean through the words which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. You see that? God is not fooled by the people who go to church and their lives are so full of sin and willful disobedience to God. They will not, they won't, they won't repent. They won't, they don't want God's change. They will not accept God's chastening. Nothing. They won't accept God's purging. They won't accept it. So, they cannot, they're not going to bear fruit if they will not abide in Christ. And to abide in Christ is to abide in the Bible. Amen to that? You believe that? You cannot have it separate. Oh, I abide in Christ. I'm not sure everything in the Bible is right. Okay? Now, maybe you're not there yet. That's fine. Okay? God will bring you there. God brought me there. God brought others there. Okay? But at the end of the road, those who are truly born again, they're in Christ. And they are in the Word. So, think about what the devil wants. Remember, he wants to ascend above the heights of the clouds. He wants to sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He wants to ascend into heaven. He wants to exalt his throne. He wants the place that has been given to us. It's what he wants. So, he cannot have us sitting where he wants to sit. So let's try to get you out. Let's try to kill you, destroy you, whatever it takes. But if you're abiding in Christ, when Christ sits on the throne, you're on there with him. When Christ judges, you're judging with him. When he comes back, we're coming back. Why? Because we're abiding in him. Okay, so I'm the vine, you are the branches, verse 5. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. I can't. Well, that may not be hell. Really? Sure looks like it. If it's burning on fire, it looks like hell. So if a man... Um, if, verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. There it is. My words, plural. How many of them? How many words can abide in us? All of, say all of them. No, really, somebody besides Liam. Say, uh, thank you, Liam, appreciate that. You're getting candy and nobody else is. How many words must abide in us? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you should... Oh, Drudge Report yesterday. The labs have now successfully produced a human-sheep hybrid. You want me to say it louder? A human-sheep hybrid. Why sheep? Okay, that is, that is mingling, that is against the Bible in every way, shape, and form. And we're living in an age the likes of which mankind has never seen before. Nobody, to my knowledge, or to histor history's knowledge, or anything else, 
at no time in history, I mean, God always said in the Old Testament, don't do this with sheep. Amen? But there were those that did, but no little sheep babies coming out, right? Because God had put a little prohibition in all of the beasts, in all the creatures, that it wouldn't work. So man says, really? You mean I can't do that? Well, guess what I'm going to do, God? I'm going to figure out a way where I can mingle humans and sheep together. So they did it. It was announced this weekend. Okay? How long? How long do you think it's going to be before the Lord comes back? We'll at least see how the sheep turn out, okay? <laughs> but I'm telling you, we're living in that age. No doubt in my mind whatsoever, okay? I never, I never pinpoint dates, times, months, years, that never, okay? But I'm telling you, we are in that age, okay? So, uh, where was I? Oh, he's, okay, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done in you. How many of you believe that? I do. God taught me that. My father taught me that. Taught me how to pray. Taught me how to ask. Taught me how to believe. Taught me how to understand that my asking was nowhere near as great as God's giving. Okay? Um, I never talk about this, but some of you have noticed I'm wearing a bracelet. Now, I'm not a bracelet guy, okay? Never wore one before. This has a name on it of somebody that I only knew for a few weeks was very, 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 very dear to me, okay? And I asked God to spare this girl's life. Okay, but he did it better than what I prayed it. See, I was praying it for me. But it turns out, God, what God did was for her. And I'm down in the woods telling God, ending up telling God how thankful I am for that. That's not how it started, but that's how it ended up. So, when you are in Christ and you're in this book, you can ask God things. You can ask Him anything. Okay? And He is not going to tell you no. He's just going to give you better than what you ask for. And you'll want it. If you abide in him, you'll want it, okay? It's the people who don't abide in Christ, they're given something better, they don't want it. It's like shove it back in God's face. That's not what I asked for! Well, doesn't that make you mad when kids do that at Christmas? This ain't what I asked for! Don't make me pull this off here. I'm, I'm slowing this down, I gotta move on. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done in you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So, we have a true vine. Look up on the screen. We have a true vine. We have a vine of Sodom. Okay? One Bible, in English, stands all by itself. Now, is it the only Bible, in English, that has ever been the Word of God? And the answer is no. Before 1611, there were other English Bibles. The key is the vine that they drew their translating from. That's the key. Because whether it was um, uh, the Bishop's Bible, which is before the King James, or the Geneva Bible, or any of the other English translations before 1611, they were pulling from a line of manuscripts that were the true vine. Does that make sense? So, did they speak differently in 1400, 1300? Yes. 
they were translated thus for their hearing and their understanding. But they, that translation was pulled from a certain line of Greek manuscripts. Okay? Thus, the King James Version. King James translators could have used the Vaticanus Greek manuscript. It was known by them. They didn't want it. Because they knew it. And if you ever read the translator's letter to the reader, they will tell you why. And they won't say it in so many words, but they will talk about the Popish Antichrist. Guess who that is? The Vaticanus, those guys knew it existed. And they knew of it. They knew its contents. And they wouldn't touch it. You know why? Because it contradicted in so many ways the other vine of manuscripts that they had access to. And they said, we're not, what are you, nuts? We're not translating from that. So they rejected it. Okay? So out comes the King James Bible. So the devil's got a workaround. We've got we to gotta destroy that Bible. We have to, we have to get rid of it. We have to... Um, they tried to destroy it as soon as it came out, and that didn't work. Okay, so, these, all these other Bibles over on your right, okay, what is their source? Where did they come from? Why, why is there a difference? What is the difference in these two vines? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.17, For we are not as many which, is, which corrupt the word of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In whom the God of, the world, God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of Christ, should shine unto them. Already, in the days of Matthew, in the days of Luke, in the days of the Apostle Paul, in the days of Peter, already in those days, see, after Christ died, after the day of Pentecost, these various men began to write their version of the life and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew wrote his, Mark wrote his, Luke wrote his. I learned, Mike, in theology class that the one of, I won't say it's the prevailing view, but one of the views of the scholars was since Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very close in how they say things, that they were all three copying from one source gospel that they gave the letter Q. They assigned it the letter Q. I have no idea why it's called Q, but it was called Q. So in other words, they theorized that there was this gospel account of Jesus Christ that somebody wrote, and that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they decided to write their version of it, decided that they would just copy out what Q wrote and use that as their gospel. Can that be possible? Is there any way that that can be possible? Turn to Luke, chapter 1. Of course, the answer is no. I'll show you why. Luke, chapter 1. Verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order the, a, de a declaration. Luke is saying there's been a lot of people writing out what they saw, what they heard, what they knew about Jesus. So look at verse 2. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word... It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. What Luke is saying here, he said, yeah, I know others have written their version of it, but look at what he said. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Notice the word perfect. Luke says 
that he was not copying what somebody else wrote. Luke says, I want to tell you my version. So, in a courtroom, let's say that Nancy finally does it and chokes her son to death. Okay? Or no, no, no. Let's say that, let's, let's make this nice. Let's say that somebody else choked her son to death and blamed it on her. And her alibi is that she couldn't have done it. Uh, she was somewhere else with some other people doing something else. Okay? Well, how do they know that? Well, Courtney and Megan and Laura saw her there. At the time of the murder... Okay, so they bring in, you know how cops do, right? When they got three witnesses, they don't say, okay, all three of you go. They split them off. Get them into a separate room. Courtney gives her account. Detective writes it all down. Megan gives her account. Detective writes it all down. Lori gives her account. Detective writes it all down. Detectives get together and compare notes. And they're going, do you see what I see? They're all three saying the same thing. Now, some of these cops might go, yeah, they're saying too much of the same thing. Come on. Three witnesses, but that if the prosecutor is going to go after Nancy, he's not going to bring these three gals in. He's going to destroy their testimony before it ever shows up in court. But the idea is all three of them with different eyes and different ears and it's sitting in a different chair. They knew and saw and said almost the identical, exact same thing. So your lawyer wants these three gals in court to testify to your alibi, and he's going to win in the eyes of the jury. What does that tell you about Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Especially when Luke says, yeah, I knew all these others were writing about it, but I wanted to write what I, because I had perfect knowledge. You know what that means? Luke is telling you, I'm not depending on what somebody else said. I had perfect knowledge of all of these things. So we just assume here that Luke, though not being mentioned specifically, was right there with these disciples every place they went. And he was either making these notes or writing this down or whatever. But he had perfect knowledge of everything that he wrote about in his gospel. He didn't get it. They didn't get it from somebody else. The whole, he had perfect knowledge of it. Okay? So, but at this time now, we already have people corrupting the story of Jesus. Jesus makes these claims, like in John. Okay? I'm, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, already in the days of John and Luke and Paul and Peter... There, are, there is a religious ideology. Um, it made inroads into Jewish mysticism. It's basically, there's one mystery under many names. Okay? And the Greeks had their version of it. The Romans had their version of it. The Jews had their version of it. It was all a mystery religion. And mystery, secretive teachings. But it was the idea, and I'm going to give you this part of it. The idea was that there is a God... But he's so high and holy above everything else that he could not have created a world. Because it's too far beneath him and too unholy and too wicked and very, whatever else. So in order for this God to create this low world, he created a lesser God. This lesser God still too holy to create the world. So this lesser God creates a lesser God than him. This lesser God still too holy creates a lesser one and then a lesser one. And, a le and as each of these lesser gods are being created, they are being created less like God and more like corruption. Guess who in their mind, is at the bottom 
of the chain. Jesus Christ. In their minds, Jesus Christ is the lesser of all of these semi-gods. If you take God and divide him in half, you have half God. If you divide that in half, you have a quarter God. You see what I'm saying? So somewhere in there, by the time you get down to Jesus, he's like one part out of 300 billionth of a God. Therefore, he can then create the world around us. So in a sense, he is a son of God, but not a direct son of God. That he is a far lesser God. That's what they believed. When they heard about Jesus, they immediately injected Jesus into their theology. Instead of letting Jesus pull them out, amen, like he did us, instead of letting Jesus pull them out of their wicked theology, they pulled Jesus into theirs. Okay? So, the New World Translation, Jehovah's Witness Bible, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Makes sense now, doesn't it? He's that one three hundred billionth of a God that is the creator of this world. It's nuts. Okay? Already, already, they're corrupting the word of God and they're corrupting the gospel of God. Let me give you two of these and I'll let you go. The first one, the gospel of Thomas. Now, go through your Bible real quick and find the gospel of Thomas. It's not there. Why isn't it there? You're going to get people online on the internet who are going to say, yeah, the Catholic Church didn't want it in there. It's got the real truth. It's got the goods. And the evil church didn't want it in there. It should be in there. So they publish. You go to some of these wacky websites and read some of these goofy magazines on UFOs and stuff like that, New Age and um, National Enquirer. You can find, you can buy a copy of these books called The Lost Gospels or The Hidden Gospels or The whatever, but they, they push these as the real story that's been hidden for thousands of years that, that the church doesn't want anybody to know about. Now, if you want to read them, that's up to you, okay? But I'm telling you, they don't tell the story that four men told. Nowhere near, okay? Because all you got to do is know what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John said and then when you start reading these other Gospels, it don't take very long to where you're going, no, I'm sorry, uh-uh, that's not what the Bible says. So, the gospel of, uh, gospel of Thomas. Here's what it begins. Here's the very beginning of the Gospel of Thomas. These are the hidden words that the living Jesus spoke. The hidden words. The central theme of, of this is that Jesus came to teach man a secret doctrine secret knowledge okay second uh, Corinthians 4 3 but if our gospel will be hid it is hid to them that are lost now the fact that this gospel of Thomas was known about by scholars but no one had ever seen one until 1945 this is part of what's called the nag nag you can write this down Hamadi H A M a-D-I, Nag Hammadi, there might be two M's in there, the Nag Hammadi Library. Some guys out digging up soil hit these clay pots, and when they pulled them up, there was about 60 some odd rolled up scrolls, some of them in halfway decent shape, that had been hidden for close to 17, 18, 1900 years. Okay? They were known about. Early writers quoted from them, but nobody had seen the full text. And now we have, in some cases, the full text of these, of these different Gospels. And when they're read, you go, that doesn't match Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? But all of these were part of the same library, and it's the, the Library of the Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C. 
Gnosticism basically is the same as the Kabbalah, which is the same as every other mystery religion in the whole world. Okay? But that's how it starts. And then you have the Gospel of Peter. In Mark 15, where Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And Mark said, that's being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he was quoting Psalm 22. The Gospel of Peter says, my power, my power, thou hast forsaken me. That sounds like Superman in front of kryptonite, right? And then he said, then Peter said, when he had said it, he was immediately taken up into heaven. In other words, Jesus didn't die on the cross. And Peter also said that Jesus never suffered on the cross. He was never in any pain. He was just kind of like that, not suffering any pain whatsoever. And then he said, my power, my power, why hast thou forsaken me? And when he said that, he was immediately lifted off the cross and taken up in heaven. Who agrees with that? You're getting a whip in. No, that's soaps for that. He doesn't understand. But anyway, that's not the gospel. But some want to push that. They want to promote it. Uh, and there were other of these books. The Gospel of the Nazarenes, Gospel of the Ebionites, Gospel of the Hebrews, Gospel of Judas. Judas Iscariot wrote a gospel. That was found also. There's one, one partial copy of the Gospel of Judas Iscariot. And it goes like this. Jesus and Judas had a secret meeting. And Jesus said, um, need you to help me do something, okay? If I'm a martyr, this thing's going to explode. So here's what we're going to do, Judas. We're going to play good cop, bad cop. Judas, you want to be the bad cop? Judas says, Lord, for you, I'll do anything. So he says, you're going to pretend that you hate me. You're going to turn me in. Judas says, okay. And he said, now, J Judas, for this, Jesus said, I am the recipient of a secret doctrine. I have not told any of the other disciples. None of them know it. But I'll tell it to you if you'll do this thing for me. And so Judas agreed. Now Judas is the one person in the Bible called son of perdition by Jesus himself. What does that say to you? Who's Judas? He's an antichrist. So the gospel of Judas is that Jesus has a secret doctrine. Judas was told that secret doctrine. Okay, and it's, and it's still a mystery. Some know it, but most everybody doesn't know it, and they're never going to know it. Okay? Um, Gnostics taught dualism. Existed between God and the world. God could not have created the world, so he created a series of emanations, demigods or demigods, each one lower than the other until finally one can have contact with the lower world. The claim of these false gospels was that Jesus was that lowest emanation who was exalted to Godhood by attainment of the mystery teachings and taught his disciples the same. Now I have two pictures up here. And I'm going to show you what they mean and I'm going to let you go. The idea was that Jesus received, himself received the secret teaching from guess who? Huh? Close. John the Baptist. Jesus, according to their idea, was a disciple of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, once John the Baptist was satisfied that Jesus knew the mystery teachings, he initiated him by baptizing him in the River Jordan. That sealed him as a student of the mysteries. Okay? So that Jesus paid obeisance to John. Instead of the other way around. Okay? Leonardo da Vinci believed this. This is what he believed. So, da Vinci was asked to paint a painting called Madonna of the Rocks. And it was, the, the nun said, we want baby Jesus in there. And the, that's some kind of angel there. The woman at the top. And... Um, so anyway, the idea was to put baby Jesus and baby John the Baptist in there. So da Vinci, smiling all the way, does this painting. There's two versions of this, because the nuns saw it and they went, repaint it. Because on the left, you have baby Jesus, 
bowing and praying to, on the right, John the Baptist, who is giving him the blessing. Dun, dun, dun. Do you see the way the finger is pointed? Okay? Over to Jesus. Here, bless Jesus. And the nuns, the nuns picked up on it. And they said, that's blasphemy. Nuns, imagine nuns saying blasphemy. So they made, there's two versions of this. The nuns rejected it and he repainted it to take these themes and elements out of it, which they hung in their nunnery, okay? But da Vinci believed it. He believed that Jesus was the recipient of mystery occult teachings from John the Baptist, and that Jesus then disseminated that to various people, one of which they say was Mary Magdalene. That Mary Magdalene and Jesus, there's a gospel called the Gospel of Mary Magdalene that states that Jesus used to kiss Mary Magdalene on the mouth all the time, and that he told her things that he didn't tell the other disciples. False gospels. Already, already, in the days right after Jesus, the real stories are coming out, and what's coming right on their heels? Lies. Forgeries. Fakes. So that, when these same Gnostics who are writing the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas... They're also taking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're taking those texts. Guess what they're doing to them? Guess. What are they doing to them? If you're a Gnostic and you're reading one of these four Gospels that's in our Bible and it doesn't say what you believe, what do you do about it? Change it. Oh, yeah, I do. Take stuff out. When you make a copy of it, you don't copy all the words. You only copy the words that don't disagree with what you believe. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? I'll give you the rest. Well, I won't give you the rest next week. I'll be resting next week. Okay? Let's stand to our feet.